Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, welcome to the session of today. Uh, well, today we want to uh, write a MATLAB application that uh, does the the design and analysis, or the analysis and design is the same thing different. Analysis and design of uh, a steel beam structure. Okay. So, uh, I hope that you're seeing everything that is present. You can see the writing on the paper very clearly. Just indicate on the live so that I'm sure that we are together and that you're getting me loud and clear so that I can, I can kickstart officially. Are you seeing me? And is everything on the paper clear? Just say yes. So I can continue. You guys are still having <laughs> some backwards. Wow. Okay, well, uh good, good. That's what I was expecting. It's now that your comments are coming. Okay, so To start with, we'll have to give ourselves a frame of work, okay? So, the work that we have to do today will be extremely tedious. It will be extremely long, okay? And I'll have to explain everything detailly. At the end of the day, we should have a beautifully working application. It may not be possible to do all of it in one session. Maybe we'll have several sessions, but I will do the maximum I can within each session because there is a lot of explanation to do. Uh, obviously, when we say for, for beam design, okay, for our particular case here, it will not be all types of beams. We will focus on, okay, so let us first of all start with, with the scope, the scope of our work, okay. The scope of our work will be uniquely simply supported beams, okay. We work only with simply supported beams. So, what you're seeing here, right? It has uh, a fixed support at one end and a ruler support at the other. So uh, all of them will be uh, will be supporting loads that are perpendicular to the neutral axis of the beam. All of them. So it is loads that are vertical if the beam is horizontal. Okay, like what we have there. So all the loads will be perpendicular. Perpendicular to neutral axis, okay, to the neutral axis of the beam. Okay, so something like that. All the loads will form an angle of uh, 90 degrees, okay, perpendicular to the neutral axis of the beam. And then we'll take into consideration uh, basically three types of loads. The types of load that we want to consider. The types of loads we want to consider is point load first. Hey, point load. So in our application, a user should be able to uh, indicate where the point load is located on the beam. Okay. We want to consider, wow, Olivia, I'm very happy to see you in class. I'm extremely glad to see you in class. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay. So, um... The next is a uniformly distributed load. So when we say point load, this is what we are talking about. Okay, the next is uniformly distributed. Let me just put it like that. And this is what we are talking about, uniform. Uniformly distributed. And then uh, the last one, trapezoidally trapezoidally. <laughs> Trapezoidally distributed. All right. So something like that. So these are the three load cases that uh, the people using our application, or we ourselves when we want to use our application, that we should be able to 
to model with no difficulty. These are the three guys here. And when we say three load uh, cases, the point of application of the loads can be anywhere. Okay, so uh, the distributed load can be on this part, on this part of the beam only. Okay, the trapezoidal load can come and add itself here on this part of the beam only. So when we say uniformly distributed, it must not be all over the span, right? And we say trapezoidal distributed must not be over all over the span. When we say point load, it must not be in the middle. It is at any given distance, okay? But uh, the addition of those loads should be made possible. Okay, so uh, the next uh, assumption we'll make will be at the level of design, okay? And the next code. And the next... Uh, yeah, at the level of design, we'll assume that the beam is laterally, laterally uh, constrained, okay? A way of saying we have no risk of uh, lateral torsional buckling, right? So, we will not take that into consideration for this application that we are, we are working on now. Yeah, oh, we'll deal with, our code will be the BS... Uh, five nine five zero right so we'll be designing using universal universal beam sections okay does that do that for the scope yeah if we're forgetting something we'll come back and then and then add it add it to the scope all right so what are the steps that we'll need to follow in the course of designing this application what are the questions that uh, we need to actually ask ourselves uh, the application should be able to excuse me. The application should be able to enable us to to model our beam. Okay, to model our beam. In modeling our beam, we are talking about uh, giving the beam a particular length. For example, what is the length of the beam, right? And then, what is the loading? What is the loading on the beam? Okay. And these loads, even what types of loads are they? What types of loads? Are they dead loads? Are they live loads? Are they uniformly distributed loads? Uh, Etc. Right? From uh, the loading and everything, the application will have to calculate what? the maximum effect of those loads within so the application will do automatic load combinations okay and then it will determine the maximum effect of those loads within the beam right so it means we will need to go to internal internal forces right so at the level we are still on analysis here and uh, for internal forces our goal will be to get what the maximum the maximum bending moment, right? And the maximum shear force due to external loads. Okay? And then from there, we'll enter, we'll enter design, right? For design, the first step is that with these things, we need to, we need to get an initial section An initial section right from the the UB database as we saw from the UB database that's what we will need to get I hope that my writing is clear enough okay an initial section from the UB database then what do we need to do when we get that section we'll need to classify the section so all these things I'm writing are the things that the application will need to will need to do. We need to classify the section according to the sections classification. We need to check that we need to check for the shear capacity to make sure that the shear capacity that the section offers is sufficient. Then uh, we need to know whether we are in a low shear, low shear or high shear case, right? Or high shear case, and correspondingly, we we'll recheck again the moment capacity, right? The moment, the moment capacity, okay. And then, if these conditions are verified, we will ascertain that the section is 
Okay, we'll just validate. We'll just validate section. Right? So this is what we want to do with this application. We just want to stop at this level, right? We just want to stop at this level. And uh, obviously, if one of these checks are not being done, then we need to go back to uh, initial, let me just say initial section here. I would just say, uh, let's just talk, call it section selection, right? We'll have to go back to choose a different section and then restart, restart the whole process all over again. Okay, so mm, when you want to do an application in MATLAB, the first step is not to go to MATLAB, okay? The first step is, first of all, to get your values and analyze what is needed. So I would like us to focus first on, on this part, okay, on the internal forces. For what is, uh, for, for the modeling itself and the collection of data for the load and the length of the beam, that one will be purely MATLAB. We'll have to do it purely in MATLAB. But for now, we have to assume that uh, a user has given us the force. He has given us the, the magnitude of the forces. He has given us the nature of the forces, whether they are distributed or not. He has given us the type of the forces, whether they are dead load or live load and all the like. And then, uh, okay, one thing I did not indicate, but it's a simply supported beam, right? So we don't need to put here uh, supports. We don't need to put here supports. It's a simply supported beam. That's our case. Um... um Yes, once we get that, okay, we need to be able to give automatically the, the internal forces. So, what we want to do now is to actually anticipate. We want to anticipate how... Uh -huh, because the, the point of application of the load is anywhere. The point of application of the load can be anyhow. So, how do we make sure that no matter how the user uh, represents his load... We have the correct maximum moment. We have the correct shear force. Well, it's simple, right? All we need to do is to generalize the different cases. And we'll apply the principles of superposition. So we'll isolate. For the case of point load, what will be the moment distribution? What will be the shear distribution? For the case of trapezoidally distributed load, which normally includes triangularly distributed load and includes even uniformly distributed load, what is the the moment distribution and what is the shear distribution? We can add all of those moment distribution, add all of those shear distributions, and then from there, we are good to go. The good thing about simply supported uh, beams is that for the shear, the maximum value of the shear will always be at the level of the support. It will be at one of the supports. Okay? If it is symmetric, then it is at both supports. But if it is not symmetric, then it will be at one of the supports. One of the supports will have the highest reaction, and that will be the value of the maximum share, right? But for bending moment, it depends on the point of application of the load, right? For that, we we'll need to differentiate the moment, equate the differential of the moment to zero, solve for x in that differential, get the value of x and replace it in uh, the the original m m of x right and then from there we'll get m max so let's go detailing let's go detailing with this i hope till now you guys are still uh, following okay so let me call this one all right and uh, let's call this two so i don't get lost in my data okay good so we want to determine internal forces. Internal forces distribution. Distribution for a first case, which will be uh, which will be point load first. Okay. Which will be point load first. So what we need to do is to generalize. Okay, we know that. A point load is located somewhere in the beam. So we have a beam. This is our beam. The beam is simply supported according to our assumption. Right? Uh, by the way, I did not I did not prepare for this. Okay? I did not prepare for this. Uh, and I intend that not to prepare for it. Because I want to place myself in the shoes of the students when they are doing 
such an exercise, okay? I do not do anything about this exercise to make sure that I'm in your shoes so that we analyze everything together. I did not pre-prepare any material here so that you are able to, in fact, you are able to relate. I want to show you guys that uh, it's not about cramming information. You have to be able to use what you have to get to get what you want, okay? It's not about when we'll be in math lab, there are places where we may be stuck, okay, in the, in the course of analyzing some things. But you have to be able to analyze things and then get the information that you need. There's times where I'm already foreseeing functions that I've already forgotten even how they how they work. But I will show you guys how I can easily retrieve the information of how they work and then get it to work immediately. So many times it's not about cramming. It's about understanding the fundamental principles that enable you to do the work effectively. Okay? Enable you to get the information that you need at the time that you need it. It's not about having all the information in the head. It's just, in fact, you get my point. I'm sure about <laughs> okay, so we have a beam. Okay, the initial thing that a user can do is indicate the length of the beam, and the length of the beam here can be any length. Okay, we can call it L. And by now, you should be understanding the, the importance of unknowns, right? <laughs> you know, people say that we have been looking for X all of our life till now. We don't know what X is, so <laughs> we have not found X till now. <laughs> Anyway, so when we say L here, we mean that L can be any value. That's why we represent it as L. Okay, so that irrespective of the value that is given there, we can have the right answer. If we are given 3 there as the answer for us, the length, for example, it means that the moment the user comes and enters 4, we are already in a different case. If he enters 5, we are already in a different case. But when we say L, L implies that we are giving our answer in terms of L. If L is equal to 2, it should give us a correct answer. If L is equal to 3, it should give us a correct answer. And so on and so forth. Right? So, um, what's it, L? Okay. Now, within this beam, the user can put his load anywhere. Okay? His load must not be in the middle. It can be anywhere on the beam. Okay, and the magnitude of his load can be anything that we will call P. Okay, it can be any value that we will call P. But irrespective of where the load is located, it has a distance from the origin. Okay, from here to here that we will call A. Okay, and it has a distance from here to here that we can call that we can call B. And obviously, B here is what is L minus A, right? The overall length minus this one. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that in our MATLAB application, what we'll be asking the user, if the user wants to add a point load, the options that we'll be giving the user is this one. We'll be telling the user, enter the value of P, enter the value of A. We must not even say enter the value of B, right? Because obviously, if he enters the value of A, we can deduce the value of B from the overall length. So enter the value of P, Enter the value of A and enter the value of L. That's all we need. Once he has entered that, we are able to, we should be able to give him what? Maximum share, maximum bending moment due to that loop. Alright? So that's what we want to want to calculate now. Good. So uh, the first thing is what? As usual, to get, get the internal process is the reactions, right? So we need to calculate the reactions. Normally, there are, there, are, there are places where we can just get this formula and then use them. But uh, I want to show you guys that you can do everything all by yourself, okay? You can, there's a reason why we teach you everything, right? Good. Uh, reactions, mm, you have that. Good. So here, I don't need to concern myself with, because here is a, it's a pin support, right? So... Normally, it has two reactions. I don't need to concern myself with the X reaction here, okay? Because there is no X force. Obviously, it will be zero. So, if I call this point A and I call this point B, I will, I will have a reaction here of RA. Let me call it RA. And I will have a reaction here of, of RB, right? So, some of us is following Y will have to be equal to zero for equilibrium, okay? 
by implication uh, RA plus RB will have to be equal to to P okay so RA plus RB minus P is equal to 0 P goes the other way it will be equal to P in fact by implication we have RA to be equal to P minus minus RB we'll call that our equation 1 we also need to make sure that the sum of moments about uh, any given point will be equal to, to zero. So since I've made RA here, sort of the formula, I will just take moments about A so that RA can be cancelled. I can get RB and replace the value here to get RA, right? So uh, sum of moments about A will have to be equal to zero. Apply that. I'm here, right? So the very first force is is this P, right? It is this way. And the perpendicular distance is A. So the moment caused by P to A will be P times times A, right? And uh, if I've taken it positive, it means that it is the clockwise direction that I've taken positive. Anything that is opposite to that will be negative, like what is here. It will cause an anti-clockwise rotation, right? So RB times L will be the moment caused by RB at the point A, but it will be negative minus RB times L, all of that have to be equal to zero for equilibrium of of moment. So by implication, I will have uh, RB, I will have RB to be equal to uh, P times A divided by, by L. Okay? So if I call this 2, then replacing Replacing 2 in 1, right, what will I get? Uh, the ramifications are that RA will be equal to uh, P minus uh, P A on, on L, right? Which uh, will normally be equal to P into L minus A divided by L, right? But what is L minus A? L minus A is B, right? Or should we just leave it L minus A? It's okay, let's call it B. No, let's leave it L minus A. No, let's call it B. Okay, so we have P, B on L. That will be our value for, that will be our value for R, A. Good. So now we have uh, the reactions. This is page three. Now we have the reactions, right? So we can go ahead and calculate the, the internal forces. So how many zones are we going to have here? Obviously, when there is a point load, it causes what? A discontinuity, right? So we'll have a zone this way and a zone this way. So we'll have two zones. Zone one. So internal forces now. Internal forces. So, zone one, what are we going to get? We have something like that, right? Uh, the distance from where we get, from where we get to the origin is always equals to x. Okay, so uh, we'll have uh, our share, we'll call it T of x, and here we'll have a moment. M of X. So let's call this M1 of X and T1 of X, right? Because they are for zone 1. And all that I see here is RA. RA was the value of RA here. Uh, PB on L, right? So I'll have here P times B divided by, by L. That's the reaction that I'm having here for zone 1. As simple as that, okay? So this way I'm having my cutting for zone 1. And this way I'll be having my cutting for zone 2. Good. Uh, so, from here, if I just do sum of forces following y equals to 0, I should get the value of T1, right? So, my T1 of x should be equal to uh, PB, PB on, on L, right? As simple as that. Okay? 
So my T1 of X should be equal to BB on L. And then uh, sum of moments, which is the point that we have got, let's call it O1. So we are calling this point here point O1, and we are calling this point here point O2. Okay. Uh, sum of moments about O1 will have to be equal to zero. The ramifications, uh, I will have, um, will I be able to write here? Let me write here, okay? Uh, I will have M1 of X to be equal to, if I've taken M1 of X, it is uh, anti-clockwise positive. This one is negative, but when it crosses the other side, it becomes positive, right? So it will be B, B on L times, times X, okay? Perfect. So it's simple, right? When I differentiate this, I have this. So my answer is correct. Okay. Next. Zone two. Zone two. Zone two, uh, how will I cut? So zone two, I can cut and then have something like that. I'll instant look. I'll cut and look this way. All right. So zone 2, this is my O2, right, uh, the moment here will be M, M2 of X, and then I have my, my share here to be T2 of X, I hope that what we are doing is clear to you now, so M2 of X and here T2 of X, okay, so um, we have our ruler support here that has a reaction, a reaction of PA on on L, right? And then uh, the distance here. We're taking the distance from the point where we are getting to the origin to always be equal to X. So the rest of the distance, which is where we are getting to the end, will always be equal to L minus minus X. Okay. So now sum of forces following Y have to be equal to zero. What are the ramifications? The ramifications are that T2, T2 of X will be equal to uh, negative PA on L, right? They are the same direction, so the other one becomes negative the other way, good. And then a sum of moments about, about O2, being equal to zero will imply that um, I will have my m m two of x to be equal to um, what would that be equal to? Uh, this is the only force this way, right? It opposes it, therefore the other way it becomes uh, positive. So I will have p a on l, which is the force, right, into l minus x, which is which is the distance. So normally, if you differentiate this, okay, you should have this, and that's exactly what it gives us, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so that is extremely correct. So we have m two of x here. So please, if in the course of my calculation you you see that I've done a sign mistake, you see that I've done a little mm, a technical mistake, please don't hesitate to indicate. So. That's what we have for the internal forces, okay? So you see that this generalizes what we have for um, for for our point load, okay? This generalizes it as as simple as as simple as A B C, okay? Okay. So what's the next thing? Normally these equations are sufficient, okay? We we can. We can look for the maximum moment due to a point load. We can use for the maximum moment due to uh, due to or the maximum share due to a point load. But I don't think it's important because the truth is that we cannot really predict whether on a beam a user will come and put only a point load or only a uniformly distributed load. You, you cannot predict, right? You you cannot really predict. So it is better for us to have an approach where, irrespective of the load that the user uh, uh, indicates, we can determine the maximum moment. So let me try to go a little bit ahead of myself to explain exactly what, what I mean by that, all right? So 
and this is our page four. Just keep in mind that we are finished with the uh, with the equations of the point load. All of these things will be extremely helpful as we go along. Okay, so let me try to get a little ahead of myself and, and explain. Imagine, okay, that a user comes to your application and he models a beam. It's always simply supported, always, always, right? And then he models a beam that has a uniformly distributed load this way. Okay, and a point load this way. Irrespective of what, let me call this Q, or let me call this P, irrespective of what he has indicated, okay, on your application, it should be able to give the maximum bending moment and the maximum shear force, right? So in this case, for example, we will have the equation due to the distributed load. I will have the equation due to the, the point load. We already have it, okay? What we will need to do is very simple, is that we will isolate the case of the point load that is here. We will calculate his own equation, the way we, we just did. And then we will isolate the case of the uniformly distributed load here. We will have his own, its own equations. And then we will add the two equations, okay? Because by superposition, it should give us the final effect of both loads. When you add the distribution of the uniformly distributed load plus the, uh, the distribution of the point load, whether it is for moment or for share, you have what? You have the compounded distributions of both of them. From that compounded equation, we can then now differentiate the moment to find the, the maximum moment that is caused by both, and that will be our final maximum moment, and differentiate uh, the... What's that? No, not differentiate, calculate the maximum value at the level of the support for the share to get the maximum share, okay, for both. We cannot say that we will get the maximum bending moment due to this load, and then get the maximum bending moment due to this load, and then add two of them to have the final maximum moment, because it will not work. Why? The maximum moment caused by this load occurs somewhere here, okay? The maximum moment caused by this other load occurs somewhere here. The two maximum moments don't even have the same point of application. So you cannot superimpose them to, to have a final maximum moment. Because depending on the distribution of this one, which will be something uh, like this, and the distribution of this one, which may be something like this, okay, you, you will find that uh, the, the, the distributions can compound themselves to form a new maximum somewhere that you did not predict. And so, just adding their maximums will put you somewhere, it will even exaggerate the real maximum of the final, the, the, the final effect. Okay, so, just, just try to get it. So, what I want to do is add the, the equation of this and the equation of this to form the new real distribution, right? And then, when we have the new real distribution, we can get the maximum of that new real distribution at any given point. Hope that is clear okay so if that is clear we can go to the next page so i'll keep this paper for for young purposes talking about young purposes we said we are dealing with three cases right we are finished with the point load what we want now is what we want the uh, uniformly distributed load and the trapezoidal load those are the two that are lacking now okay let me give a proposal. Why? Right, let's add even there. Let's add. We said that when we remember something on our scope, we'll come and add, right? So this is our scope here. Let's add triangularly distributed. So I'll show you guys that these three last loads are actually the same things. Okay? No need to stress. We can generalize them in just one instance and just and just finish with it. Okay? So may I surmise, I, I, I propose that <laughs> if I model a trapezoidally distributed load, okay, with all its unknown variables, then just with the trapezoidally distributed load, I can model a uniformly distributed load, I can model a triangularly distributed load. Let me explain. How is the trapezoidally distributed load? Obviously, we say... Um, We are saying that a trapezoidal distributed load can be found anywhere on the beam. Okay? It can be anywhere on the beam. So, for us to 
be able to anticipate and cater for all of the cases that the user can possibly model, we'll have to, again, present a variable form of the, of the situation, right? So, for that, I will put any trapezoidal load somewhere here in the middle. All right? So, trapezoidal load, what does it have? It has a load here, Q1. It has a load here, Q2. Okay? Now, we'll say the beam, as usual, has an overall distance of of L and we'll call this distance here A, we'll call this distance here uh, uh okay B, we'll call this distance here C. They are just variable names, right? So we'll call that A, we'll call that B, we'll call so what are we saying? We are saying that B is always the span of the trapezoidal load. Okay, B is always the span. If we have B, in fact, we are saying that A plus B plus C should always be equal to L, first of all. And then B will indicate, okay, the span of where the trapezoidal load is being applied. And A will always indicate the beginning, okay, the distance from the beginning to the end point of trapezoidal load. And C will indicate the distance from the end to the end, okay? So with this, I can model any, any trapezoidal load, okay? If I wanted to start... In, I want the trapezoidal load to start in the beginning here. All I need to say is that A is equal to zero, and that's all. If I wanted to start at the end here, all I need to say is that C should be equal to zero, so that there will be no this distance will not exist, and the trapezoidal load will start here. Okay, so this will model for any any case of trapezoidal distributed load. Now, if we succeed in getting the distribution of this one. We have finished the uniformly distributed load and we have finished triangularly distributed load. Let me explain why. In the case of a uniformly distributed load, we are simply saying that Q1 will be equal to Q2. That's all. It's true now. If Q1 is equal to Q2, then we are, in the case of a uniformly distributed load, it will be just straight. All of this will be just straight, okay, to form a uniformly distributed load. And that's that. Okay, and uh, for the triangularly distributed load, if Q1 or Q2 is equal to zero, and uh, Q2 in this case or Q1 is different from zero, then we are in the case of a triangularly distributed load. So if the value here is zero, right, if this height here is zero, and this one has a value, then it will go from zero to that value. That would be a triangularly distributed load, right? And if this one is zero and this one has a value, then you go from zero to that value as simple as that. I hope that is clear till now. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> I'll be sweating today and teaching. I hope that this is clear by now, right? So if we finish this case, we have actually generalized for the uniformly distributed load and for the trapezoidal distributed load. Okay. So we can get back the formula for uniformly distributed load just by replacing Q1 and Q2 by a certain Q and then resolving the final equation that we got. And we'll get the exact moment distribution and shared distribution of a uniformly distributed load for the same case scenario. Okay. So uh, that being said, we were on page 4, right? So let's go to page 5 now and do just that. Okay. So, at page 5, okay, so you remember here we said one, one point load, okay? So, for two, for two, we'll just generalize, we'll just, Henry, come here, I'm happy to read from you. I didn't know that you were in class. So, two, we'll just generalize, uh, what was that again? Trapezoidal. Trapezoidal, okay, and this will include uniform and triangular, right? So it's trapezoidal distributed load, okay? So our model to be able to anticipate any given case scenario will be this one.
Okay, so here we have cure one, here we have cure two, here we we'll call it A, here we we'll call it uh, B, and here we we'll call it C, right? And the distance from here to here, we'll call it uh, L. So that will be our modeling, okay, to generalize for any other types of load that the user can can want to to model, right? Okay. First things first, reactions, right? So for reactions. Who get reactions? Uh, obviously, the loads are what vertical, right? So uh, by implication, I will have again an RA here and uh, an RB here. If I call this point A and I call this point point B, so some of forces, some of forces following Y will have to be equal to zero. What are the ramifications? So, in this case, we have a distributed load, right? For the distributed load, we need to convert it to what? We need to convert it to uh, an equivalent point load, right? And to do that, the magnitude of the point load will be equal to the surface area of the shape of the uniformly distributed load, okay? And then the point of application of the point load will be equal to uh, the center of gravity of the shape of a uniformly distributed load following following x right um so to ease our work what we'll do in this case what we'll do is to separate that particular shape that we have there okay which is trapezoidal into a triangularly distributed load and uh, so we'll have something like that okay we'll have a triangularly distributed load up and we'll have a uniformly distributed load Uniformly distributed load down. So if all of this height is cure two and this height here is cure one, it means the distance here obviously will be cure one. Okay, and uh, the left over distance here will be cure two, which is this overall distance minus minus cure one. Okay, so the final uh, model of that. I think I'll need to redraw that. Okay, before coming to the sum of forces, let's let's try to redraw that. So that we are clear. Okay, so obviously from this, I will have now two point loads, right? One load from uh, the triangularly distributed load and the other load from the uniformly distributed load. Uh, which one will happen before which one? Two third and half, which one is greater than the other? It's two third, right? Yeah, it's two third. So anyway, not a problem. Let's go one after the other. So I'll have my distance. I'll have my distance A somewhere here. A remains. Okay. It is B that may that may vary. Okay. And uh, we'll have our distance here. Our distance here. Now, for this uniformly distributed load here. Okay, the corresponding point. We want the surface area of the shape of the uniformly distributed load, which is Q1 times times B. The surface area, the, the, the shape here is a rectangle, and the surface area will be Q1 times times B. That's the magnitude. And where will it occur? It will occur at the center of gravity of that which is half. So it will be B on two. Okay. So the distance from here. So where we have a point load here will have to be uh, B on two. Uh, sorry, B on two here. Yes, because here is B, right? And uh, the value of the load here will be Q one, Q one B. So the next thing is this triangle. It occurs at two third. Okay. So the center of gravity is two third from the smaller side and one third from the bigger side okay so let me just use my rough work so it means that at the distance of b on two i will have a point load q b and then at the distance of two b on three two b on three i will have another point load okay the question is how do we get this what is this distance here 
right? So the distance here will be uh, 2b on 3 minus minus b on 2. I think you agree with me. And uh, what will that be? Uh, if I multiply up and down here by 2, I have 4 here. I multiply up and down here by 3, I have 3 here. So 4 minus 3, I hope I'm correct. Yes, yes, I have 3 here on 6, right? And then here I have uh, 4 here on 6. 4 minus 3 gives us 1. So I will have I will have B on 6 to be this distance. Right? So what we are saying is that from here to here is where the center... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I've exaggerated that. Oh, my God. B on 6. Let's just manage. Oh, la, la. We'll have another distance here before having C. I have not draw that well. Please, let's just... We'll just manage it like that, okay? Yeah. So... We have the corresponding point load here. What's the value of this point load? It is uh, the surface area of the shape of the uniformly distributed load. Oh, thank you, Rita, for the answer. It will be the surface area of the shape of the uniformly distributed load, which is what? A half base times height, right? Because we have a triangle here. Okay? But what is the base? B. And what is the height? Q2 minus Q1. So, I will have Q2 minus q1 all that times b on on two so this is already becoming complex right so i need you guys to be fully attentive so that if i have any okay if i do any kind of mathematical mistake then you can always um, you can always help me so the overall distance from here to here is supposed to be b okay so we have taken b on two here we have taken b on six so the question is what is the leftover distance here that should be b on three right it should be B on 3. So the addition of this and this and this should give us B. Okay. So let's try that. 3 here. 3 plus uh, 1 plus 2 gives us 6. Right. 6 divided by 6 gives us 1. So that's correct. All of that will give us will give us uh, B. So this is the corresponding point load system of this stuff. Okay. That we will be using to get the, to get the reactions. So I hope that that is correct. So please, if you see that is correct, just say correct, okay, so that we can we can continue. So now I can say some. I can say uh, sum of forces following y equals zero, okay, and the ramifications here. What are the ramifications? What are the ramifications? Sum of forces following y equals zero. <laughs> okay, so I have my. Let's not forget that we have our RA here. And we have our RB, our RB this way, okay? So in this case, I'll have RA to be equal to, um, what's that? RA to be equals to Q1B plus Q2 minus Q1B uh, on 2, all of that minus RB. Okay, I can simplify this right. I have Q1B here and I have Q1, Q1B here. It means I can add those two, right? So at the end of the day, I will have RA to be equal to something like uh, Q1B minus Q1B should give me at the end of the day something like Q2 plus Q1 all that times B on 2 minus, minus RB. Yeah, that should be correct. So, uh, if you don't get this, please, you go step by step, okay? Just go step by step and you should find the same answer. And please confirm to me that uh, it's it's correct. So, you can just say something like reactions correct, okay? Good. The next thing we want to do <laughs> is to calculate the moment. What am I saying moment? Calculate RB. <laughs> So, yes, a review will actually be some of moments following A, right? Or around A has to be equal to zero. So, this is page five. Some of moments around A will have to be equal to zero. Some moments around A have to be equal to zero. What are the... Oh, I love, I'm not seeing what I'm writing. Some moments around A have to be equal to zero. What are the ramifications? 
Um, I want to take look at this when I'm on when I'm on A this way. Okay, so what will happen is this one will cause a clockwise rotation. This one will cause a clockwise rotation. This one will cause an anti-clockwise rotation. Okay, so I will take this one first and I will equate it to this one because when they cross the other way, they become positive. They are in opposite directions, right? Good. So I will say R B L, which is what this force causes as moment around A. I will have R B L will be equal to now this one. What would this one cause? It will be cure one B times perpendicular distance, which is A plus B on two, right? Um, so I will have cure one B times perpendicular distance, which is A plus A plus B on two. A plus B on two, right? And then uh, the other one, the other one will be this force. <laughs> Oh my god, plus let me write it down, you'll be a little bit long. Cure cure two minus cure one, all of that into B on two. Okay. Perpendicular distance here is A plus this two, it is what two B on three, right? So uh A plus two B on three. So it will be all of these times. God, A plus 2B divided by A plus 2B divided by 3. If I do a mistake, just halt me. Okay? So let me be sure what I'm writing. Yes, correct. A plus 2B and 3. Yes, correct. Okay? So we we'll need to we we'll need to simplify this in order to find RB in uh, the most acceptable form possible. So what I'll do, I'll just, okay, then to skip steps, I'll just, let's just go detailing. So by implication, uh, RBL, let me call it RBL for now, will be equal to, uh, can we bring all the terms, this is Q1AB, right, the multiplication of these two, Q1AB. So let's just bring all of the terms in AB uh, together. Uh, please, if you're not seeing well, Chage, just try to just try to increase the quality of your of your YouTube video. Okay, please try to increase the quality of your YouTube video because I think it, it should be clear. Try to put it to three hundred and sixty. Okay, so uh, cure one A B. I said so. I will have cure one A B. Okay, and then this way also. I will have minus cure one a a b on two. Okay. The next thing is cure one uh, b squared, right? So plus cure one b squared on two for this one. Okay. And then I'll come here and look at this other one, right? So it will be this times that times that. Am I supposed to multiply this like this? Wow, be careful. There is a problem here, right? There is a whole big multiplication to do at this level, right? So uh let's just let's just abort, let's abort this and just open the bracket. So I'll have RBL to be equal to let's just open the brackets everywhere brutally, right? Q1 A B plus Q1 uh, B squared on two, and then this way. Uh, I'll just say plus B on 2, then I'll multiply, I'll multiply whatever we are having here. It will be Q2A, okay, Q2A, uh, plus 2, Q2B on 3, okay, I'll finish with this one. And then this one now minus uh, Q1A, mm, Minus two Q one B minus two Q one B on three, right? So we should have something like that, and now we can see how B multiplies everywhere. So now let's bring all of the terms in the way we were doing, all of the terms together. We can even just add them immediately. Okay, so we have here Q one A B, and we have here 
cure one okay a b so but it will be minus it's minus like that it's minus i hope you're seeing that it's minus cure one a b hmm. does that cancel no it's on two okay b on two so cure one a b on two it will be negative and here is positive so at the end of the day i will have cure one a b all of that on all of that on two right good and then this way i will have uh cure one b squared on two and it is minus two thirds of cure one b squared no this two here will cancel this two so it will be one third let me let me put it here right so i'll have cure one b squared on two normally that is how and it is minus because this is minus here one times times this one to give me cure one b squared and then this two will cancel to give me one third okay so multiplying up and up and down here by three i will have three on six multiplying up and down here by two i will have two on six this is three minus two to give me one six right so i will have plus cure one b squared divided by by six that's my next term and then uh, what i will have next is this term in cure 2 which would be plus um, cure 2 a b on 2 and uh, what was the last one now plus uh, cure 2 b squared on 3 something like that okay it should be something like that at the end of the day so uh, again i'm counting on you guys okay if i'm making any mathematical errors here uh you let me know so it will be all of that divided normally by by l so i'm wondering am i bringing all of the terms in cure 1b together and all of the terms in cure 2b together or should we just leave it like that and move on hmm what term is common there? B is common. I'm trying to find a way of writing it in a more simplified manner. So B is common. Yeah, B is common all through. So uh, if I say B on L into all of that, well, it's okay. Okay, so uh, at the end of the day, we'll just have R B. Please confirm to me that the reaction is okay. Okay. I think you're following up. If you understand, just let me know that it's okay so that I'm sure that we are not making any mistakes here. So I don't know how long that reaction is. Imagine how we'll be using it at the level of moments and, and all the like. Okay. Uh, bring the terms of Q1 and Q2. So I should bring those terms together. Does it really change much? Okay, yeah. Why not? So let's go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, Brenda. So uh, I'll have cure one. Let me just say cure one B on L, okay, into for this one, into uh, there is six here under, right? There is six here under. If I bring the six under outside, what does it give me? Let me say six here. Cure one B on 6L, okay? Then what will I have here? To make it on 2, I will have 3, 3A, right? Plus, uh, plus B. Wow, that's a nice way of writing it. Okay, that's a very nice way of writing it. So, once we be sure that when we multiply, we get this 2, okay? Q1, B on 6L times this will give us, yes, it will give us just that. And Q1, b on 6l times this will give us yeah just that don't this l comes from the l here i hope you can you can see that so let me just do a similar thing plus cure 2b on uh, yeah on 6l why not cure 2b on 6l which will give me something like uh 3a plus plus 2b now this is more beautiful this is this is nice don't you think so guys i think it's nice <laughs> yeah thank you again so we have that 
perfect. So that's our RB. Uh, now we can, if we call this equation one, okay, equation one, and here we have our equation, our equation two, right? So we can replace two in one, right? To find our A. We can replace two, two in one to find uh, our A. So what would that give us? Mm. Mm. Are they even compatible? Not really, right? Okay. So let, let's just write. Okay. So we we'll have uh, we we'll have our a to be equal to here. I have this on that. It's a uniformly distributed load when it multiplies by a distance, it becomes a point load. Okay. Perfect. And here. Uh, this times that uniformly distributed load and multiplied by point load. Perfect. Okay. Good. I was just checking for homogeneity here eh, because the units have to be in forces, right? So we need to make sure that all of uh, the, the, uh, the distances cancel, knowing that the distributed loads are in force per meters. So at the end of the day, we should have just a force, a force unit. Okay. So yeah, that's correct. So our A now will be equal to. All of this ground fray here, okay, which is cure two plus cure one times B on two, cure two plus cure one times B on two minus minus all what we just did, okay? So it will be minus uh, cure one B on six L into three A plus B, then minus cure two B on six L into 3a plus 2b right so this is what we'll get all right so uh having that how can we simplify this we are still having cure 1b on something here so if we bring this term in cure 1 into this bracket maintain the the cure 1b on uh, what are we going to get will it work yeah, it will work, but we we'll need to be very technical about it, right? So it means that I will have cure one B on six L um, into three A plus B, but then there is something I will need to add, right? No, this is negative. I cannot say cure one B on six L. This is negative here, so. Either I put the negative outside, okay, or I put it inside and something happens. So let me put it outside for now. And uh, what will happen here, we need to make sure that we add the next terms here, which will be uh, plus. No, it will be minus, so that minus times minus gives us plus, okay? So minus, and then we need to make sure that this term here, when it multiplies by this, Okay, we want to write something here in such a way that when this multiplies by this, it gives us this term here. Okay, so we have taken cure one b and all that outside. What will be left? Obviously, there will first of all be an l. There will be an l somewhere because l have to cancel this l. Okay, this six here, there will need to be a three somewhere, so that three divided by six will give us three. Uh, yeah, divided by six will give us a half that we are having here. And I think that's it. The B here is already represented and everything is already represented. So that should give us that. So I think that's correct, right? Please confirm it. Confirm it to me, okay? You guys, you know, you guys are doctors in these things. <laughs> Good. And then uh, for the other one, it will be something extremely similar. So I'll just have negative Q to B on 6L into 3A plus 2B. Uh, minus hmm, minus what minus 3 l right yeah minus 3 l it will be the same thing it will be the same thing so is that is that correct please just tell me is our just say are a correct if you confirm that the answer is correct and please don't confirm for confirming sake check to make sure that it gives all because if we do any mistake here <laughs> Our program will behave waywardly, 
okay? You will behave a type. You will do any kind of mistake here. Okay, uh, so to better simplify what I will do, I want to send these negatives inside, all of these negatives, so that it will be more beautiful, okay? So at the end of the day, I will have R A to be equal to cure 1 B divided by 6 L into 3 L minus 3 A minus B and plus cure 2 B divided by 6 L into 3 L minus 3 A minus 2 B. That's what I want. Okay, that is a problem with R B. Oh, yeah, yeah. With R B and where is the problem? Her. Brenda, why do you think there's a problem with R B? Anyway, we'll have a way of checking whether these answers are correct, okay? So let's check whether these answers are correct. To check if they are correct, we'll try to take a scenario like uh, this one. I want to model a uniformly distributed load like this. All right, so I'll have this and I'll have that. Let's say our length here is our length here is L and the value of our load is Q. So if the value of our load is Q, I want to model this. What we are saying is that from our representation, from our representation of uh, the trapezoidal load here, okay, to model this, the value of A will have to be equal to zero, right? So that this can start here. The value of B will have to be equal to L, okay, so that the span is all true. And the value of C will have to be equal to 0. And Q1 will be equal to Q2, and all of them will be equal to Q, which is this one. Okay? So we need to re re uh, represent these values in the equations that we have here. So normally the reactions for this one, we call this point A and we call this point B. The reaction, the correct reactions, RA will have to be equal to RB, which is equal to cure L on 2. So now let's replace these values into these equations to see whether we have the answer to be cure L on 2. If the answers are cure L on 2, then our equations are correct. If they don't give us cure L on 2, then there is a mistake. There is a mistake somewhere. I will need to figure that out. Okay? So let's look at that. Oh, <laughs> I like this. Oh my God. I hope that all of you are following up, and I hope that is uh, is quite interesting. Okay, so um, let's replace. So for R B, let me go to R B. If I say A is equal to zero, okay, A is equal to zero here. I will have first of all cure because my cure one is equal to cure. Then my B is equal to L, right? Divided by by six L into what will I have here? A is equal to zero. So this one disappears. All of that times times L. So I will have this particular answer here. Okay? And then uh, plus Q2 will be Q also. The value of B is L divided by, by 6L. And then uh, here I will have what? 3A0. So my 2B here will give me 2L because B is equal to L. Okay, so let's see. Uh, does that give us cure L on 2? So normally this L cancels this L. This L cancels this L. What I will have here is 1 on 6 normally plus 1 on 3. That's what I'm having. Okay, so why, why even stress? Just say plus 2 on 6. And that gives me what? 3 on 6, which gives me half. Okay. So RB is actually equal to cure L on 2. Alright? RB is equal to cure L on 2. So Brenda, that RB equation does not have a problem. That RB is extremely correct. Okay? So please check again what, what you got there. If you replace these values and you get the same answer like me, let me know. I don't think I've made a mistake here. And then let's now check whether our RA also... Uh, RA also is correct. This is a formula for RA. Alright. So for RA, RA, our Q1, our Q1 is Q. Okay, our B is equals to L divided by 6L. And then we have 3L. That one does not change. 
A is equal to 0, but B is equal to L, so minus L, okay? And then with this one plus our cure 2 is cure, is cure, and our B is L, okay? Divided by, by 6L, all of that times 3L minus A here is equal to 0, so it will be minus 2, it will be minus 2L, right? So at the end of the day, what we are going to get is um, 3L minus... 3L minus L is, this L cancels this L, okay? So, I'll have 2 pure L, this L, right? 2 pure L divided by 6, and then plus uh, A, plus, okay, let's just go. Plus, again, this is 3 minus 1 plus pure L, this L cancels this L, plus pure L on 6, okay? So, all of that gives me, 3 cure L on 6, which gives me cure L on 2. So perfect. Okay, so our RA and our RB are they are correct. Okay, they are extremely correct. Good. Very, very precious formulae. So uh this is our page six. I don't have space to write six again. This is our page six. Okay. So, that's not it. We are not done just yet, right? So, the next thing we want to do is to calculate the internal forces. Alright? Good. For the internal forces, let me say something. The truth is that for the internal forces, the, what we are looking for, we are looking for the, the maximum value. Okay? We are not trying to draw the, the bending moment equation or the shear equation. But we can even do that. Why not? We can add that to our application. It makes it even more beautiful and even more complete and even more interesting. So, let's just go ahead and do that. We don't lose anything in doing that. Okay? So, uh, let's continue. So, now we, we go to internal forces. You are not seeing what I'm writing? Okay? Internal forces. So, for our internal forces, what we have here is, uh, how many zones do we have? We have three zones, right? We'll have zone 1 here, where we'll get an O1. We'll have zone 2 here, where we'll get an O2. And we'll have zone zone 3 this way, where we'll get an O3. Okay? So, we need to calculate for each of those zones. <laughs> God, those reactions are long. <laughs> okay, so... What we'll do here, okay, I will not, uh, no, we have to, we have to, I wanted to say that I will not carry the value of the reactions along in details, must I do that? No, we must not, we must not carry the value of the reactions along in all details, okay, so we'll express our value in terms of the reactions, so in the course of our programming, what we'll do is that, we will just say, um, we will calculate RA first and then calculate uh, M of X in terms of RA and T of X in terms of RA. Or, yes, yeah, we can do that that way so that it eases calculation so that we don't draw all of this formula along with us. I'm sure you guys understand exactly what I'm talking about, right? Good, so to get the, the first zone, we'll have zone 1. And sorry, when we're doing zone one here, I do not delimit. I do not delimit where zone one starts and where it ends. Here, our zone one here for the first one starts at uh, all that. Oh, it will be different, huh? Okay, so this is it. Okay, it starts from. It goes from zero to A, right? So X here goes from. X here goes from zero to A, and in zone two, X goes from A right up to right up to L. So that's what we have for the point load. Okay. For the uniformly distributed load, uh, our first zone will be from zero, uh, rather for the trapezoidal distributed load, from zero right up to, right up to A, right? So I'm getting here and I'll look this way, obviously guys, obviously. I cannot, 
you look that other way, you are, you are looking for trouble alone. Nobody, nobody helps you. You are, you are just entering your own troubles alone. So, uh, we'll have this. Alright. Uh, moment. T1 of X. And then here I will have M1 of X. The distance from here to here will be X. And the distance from here, what am I saying? The reaction here is RA. Anything I'm forgetting? No. Okay? It's just to represent what you're seeing. I'm not, I'm not forgetting anything. So, what we are saying is that T1 of X will be equal to uh, RA. That's our first. So, I'll not come and write RA here again as the very long expression that we are having uh that we are having down here okay so i calculated r a we'll use r a okay so now r a is known it's no longer unknown it has been expressed in terms of known values good and then the next thing is uh, m1 m1 of x will be done by the sum of moments about the point o1 right so we'll have m1 of x to be equal to hmm yeah, that's simple right r a x R A X. So we have that. Good. Uh, that's for zone one. That's finished. Uh, zone two. Zone two will go from uh, A X right, uh, right up to what A plus B right. Okay, so it will go from A right up to A plus B. So all of this will be our zone 2. Okay, so in zone 2, we'll get, and I prefer looking this way because this way it will be X. If I look that way, it will be L minus X, which add another complexity. Good, so this is where there's another work again to do. <laughs> Very interesting. So um, we'll have this. I will have the simply supported that. I will have my RA this way. Okay. Uh, we'll have a trapezoidally distributed load here that will stop at O2. Okay. We'll have here M2 of X. Right. We'll have our T2 of X this way. Now. The overall distance from the origin right up to the curtain will take it to be x, okay? But this distance here from here to here is known, right? The distance from here to here is known, and the value is uh, the value is a. This one, okay? It's already known. So we we'll have a here. It implies the distance from here to here will be x minus minus a. Here is our load. Eh? Yes, our load. So here we have our cure one, no problem. And here we have our <laughs> we have cure of X. Okay. We have a certain cure of X because we don't know. The highest value is a cure to search, but we don't know the value of of cure of X. And that's the first thing we need to determine. We need to determine the value of cure of X because we have cut here. At any given point, at any given point x, right? Getting here at any given point x means that we have here to be to be cure of x, and then uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have it in that vantage point, knowing that x will always vary between what a and a plus b for it to be for it to be valid. So what are we seeing? We need to get the value of cure of x. To be able to continue, we need to get that equation. We need to get the corresponding height of the trapezoidal distributed load at any given point where we are cut. So, for that, I will use the equation of of a straight line, okay? Because the distribution here is a straight line that goes up, okay? And uh, the straight line which we are looking for, which is cure of x, I will say it is equal to a certain a x. Okay, let me not use a. Because we are already using the distance A. I don't want to confuse you guys. What letters can we use again? Mm. What letters? Let me say W. 
and y okay so i'll say it, it will be equal to w x plus plus y so we are looking for w this is the equation of a straight line okay this is the equation of a straight line this is the y uh intercept and here is the gradient right you know that stuff so um w x plus y i know the values of q of x at given points so i know for example that q of a okay when i'm at a here the value of uh q should be equal to q one right so i'll have w into a rita why are you saying um is there any problem? I'm not supposed to read that as M or M. Ah, okay. You're proposing the, the variables, and I agree with you. Let me use M and N. Thank you. Thank you. This W and Y like that. It was strange even for me. So, I will say Q of X should be equal to MX plus, plus N. Thank you, Rita. Good. Okay. So, we are looking for the value of M. We are looking for the value of n right so at x equals to a which is here okay the value of q of x will be equals to q1 so what i'm saying is that q of a will be equal to m a plus n we're just replacing everywhere we see x by a and the corresponding value will be q1 which is this one okay and then we know from the original diagram also that at a plus b Okay, at x equals to a plus b, we will have uh, we will have the value of q of x to be q two. Wow, Victor is in. Thank you, welcome, Victor. I'm happy to see that you're you're present. That's great. Okay, so um, we will have q of a plus b to be equal to m of a plus b plus n. And the answer is supposed to be q2, right? That is supposed to be the value of q at q equals to 2. Okay, great. So what we need to solve, this is will be equation 1, and this will be equation 2. We need to solve these two for, for m and n. Okay, so obviously I can do that by elimination, right? So if I do this minus that, what happens? Or let me do this minus that instead, this minus that. If I do 2, so what I'm doing here is 2 minus 1, okay? Equation 2 minus equation, minus equation 1. So let me start here. MA minus MA gives us 0. What I'm left with is MB, right? I'll have MB. N minus N gives us 0 would be equal to Q2 minus Q2 minus Q1. So we are looking for N, right? So by implication, I will have uh, M. To be equal to q2 minus q1 on on b that will be my m okay that'll be my m and then uh, what else are we looking for we're looking for n now right i can replace the value of m in any of the equations so I can replace the value of m in any of the equations. I'll replace it in equation 1, and then we'll get the value of, of n here, right? Good. So I'll have... Uh, mm, what is that? Okay, so I'll have m... Uh, m is q2 minus q1 on b, right? On b, great. And all of that have to be multiplied by a and plus n. It should give us it should give us q1. That's what we that's what we have. Okay, that's what we have from this equation here. Good. So let's just pull n and then we we are good to go. So what we are saying is that n will have to be equal to q1 minus all that. Okay, q1 minus Q2 Q2 minus Q1 times A on, on B. I was seeing how I was trying to, to, to see how I can simplify this also. Uh, we bring the terms in. Which one here is? Okay, good. 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 Okay, it's okay. We can we can leave it like that 
or maybe I bring all the terms in pure one together. I prefer bringing all the terms in pure one together. So I'll have um, Q1 minus QB on 2. So at the end of the day, we'll have uh, Q2 times A on B minus that, that, that. No, let's leave it like that. It's okay. Let's leave it like that. Anyone is correct. So at the end of the day, I will have my Q of X to be equal to, it is what? It is MX plus N, right? I have the value of M. So it will be. Um, Q2 minus Q1, all that divided by B, all that times X, and then uh, plus N, right, which is uh, plus Q1 minus Q2 minus Q1 A on A on B. Okay. So this will be a constant, all of this will be a, a constant value, okay? We can even call this constant as another term, eh? okay? Let's just keep it as n, okay? So that we'll call it n because the most important thing here is this x. Or we'll call this one m, we'll call this one n. The most important thing here is this x, okay? So memorize, very important formula. We have said m is equal to q2 minus q1 on b. And then we have said n is equal to... Uh, q1 minus q2 when i say memorize i don't mean cram it. i'm just saying write it somewhere so we we'll use this very we we'll use this formula so that from now henceforth we can just write our q of x as as mx plus n we know the value of m so all of this i'm doing is not is in order not to pull very large expressions along the way we can just use the minimum that we have and it's okay for us okay we don't want to pull large expressions all through but it's important that we should be able to express uh, our moments and our share all of them we should be able to express them as polynomials okay good so that being said we are back to this to this guy so i'll call this a uh, page uh, which page are we on Okay, I'll call this page seven. Okay, and uh, well, I'm not yet finished with this page, but I want to finish with it because I'm not sure that it can support. Okay, let me just say page eight. Page eight. All right. So, uh, what we want to do now? What we want to do now is we have this right. But this is a uniformly distributed, this is a distributed loan, not uniformly distributed loan necessarily, but this is a distributed loan. We want to convert it to uh, a point loan, okay? So what we'll do is, uh, obviously, we'll separate this into a triangle and a rectangle again, all right? So the distance here is Q1. It means that we have a uniformly distributed load of Q1 down, which is applied at the center of gravity of the rectangle, which will be X minus A on 2. Okay? And you will have this corresponding uh, corresponding value. And then we have another load here that comes from the triangle applied at 2 X minus A on, you know the stuff, you know the deal. And uh, the magnitude will be the, 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 the surface area of the triangle, but the height here this time around changes, right? The height here is Q1, and the height here changes, this one. It becomes Q of X minus, minus Q1, the height of the triangle, okay, where we will do half base times, half base times height. So, let's implement that and have a new, a new representation. So it means that finally I'll get something like this. I have my load. Here is our A. Okay. And then uh, I have my two loads. One from the uniformly distributed load, which is here. And the magnitude of this load will be the surface area of the uniformly distributed load, which is what? Uh, this times that, right? So it is Q1 times X minus A. So I'll have it here. Q1 times x minus a and then i have the other load which is after that which will be um, the resultant from the triangularly distributed load right uh, which will be half base times height surface area of the shape of a distributed load 
and uh, the height here is cure of x minus cure on one and here the base is x minus a so it is cure of x minus cure one okay into x minus a all of that divided by by two are you seeing those expressions God. okay good so uh we are here okay and then we've cut we've cut somewhere here and this is where we have our m2 of x and uh, we have two our t2 of x right good so um that being said what i will do here is quite simple we'll calculate the moment okay we'll calculate the bending moment and then we we'll differentiate to have the value of of the share it's as simple as that calculate the bending moment and we'll differentiate to have the value of of the share okay good so the distance from here to somewhere here we have already established the distance okay it will be a okay a this one is applied at half because it's the one of so we have x minus a all on two at half of this right and then this other one we already calculated the similar thing so that's why i can do it so easily so we have x minus a all on six this way if i'm wrong you correct me and what is left here is x minus a all on all on three so please if i'm wrong you correct me but we already calculated the similar thing when we were calculating uh, reactions all right so uh let's look for the moment on page nine We call this page nine. Good. So um, for the bending moment, we we'll take uh, sum of moments about O two will have to be equals to zero. I hope you guys are still following. Please, if you're following, just type it there. We are. We are I'm following. Just say I am following. Okay, just type it. So here, uh, what are we going to get? We first of all get from R A, right? So we we'll have m two of x. So when I say m two of x, and I say equal to everything that opposes it becomes positive. This other way, right? Let me start with this. I will have R A. Okay, times the distance. Okay, which why did I call this? Yeah, that's correct. It's correct, right? It's x minus a because all of this is x, right? So this is x minus a. Good. Very, 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 very correct. So at the end of the day, we we'll have our a into perpendicular distance. Perpendicular distance is uh, a plus plus x minus a, right? Oh, me too. <laughs> Oh, come on. From even the original diagram, right? It is R A times times X. Okay. So we have no problem there. R A X. <laughs> Try. The way I see large expressions and you have the impression that everything after that will just be complex. So <laughs> So it will be R A X. Let me let me restart that down here. So we we'll have M2 of X will be equal to R A X. Okay? Will be R A X. And then um, the next load is this one. But it is in the same direction as the moment compared to, to the load, right? So we'll have minus because when it crosses it becomes negative. If you was still on the same side with M2 of X will have been positive. So we'll have minus the value of the load Q1 into X minus A times what perpendicular distance to the point of application okay this is a perpendicular distance right here perpendicular distance would be um and we just sum that up one seat plus one third what does that give us one seat plus one third is two two here is that what we've been adding ever since is half right uh yeah if i multiply by two i multiply by two then i'll have one plus two to give me three then 
I will have 3 on 6, then I will have half move. So uh, that will give me x minus a on 2. Logically, I should have seen it even from here, but well, it's okay. So we'll have cure 1, da 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 da. da. We're we'll finished with cure 1. Now, the next one, which is still minus, it will be minus, and let me continue it down. Cure of x, the magnitude of the load, minus cure 1 into x minus a all on 2 times perpendicular distance, which is what? This one, right? x minus a all on all on 3 x minus a all divided by 3 okay that's what we get mm -hmm. so now we have to simplify it okay so uh, we will have to open we we'll have to open cure of x as mx as mx plus n okay knowing what m is and knowing what n is but what we want to do now is we simply want to bring all of the terms in x squared together. If there are terms in x cubed, we want to bring them together. If there are terms in... Uh, oh, lambda is there. Interesting. Good. So if there are terms in x cubed, we want to bring them together. x squared together, x together, and constants together. Okay, we want to have our polynomial, our polynomial complete the way it is supposed to be. Hmm. Okay, so let's, let's expand. Okay, so... We we'll have our ax remains there. Here, what am I going to get? Uh, let me maintain the, the, the cure one outside first and multiply what is inside. So, what is inside will be x squared. So, I'll say x1 on 2. Okay, let me keep the 2 outside also. What I have inside will be x squared minus 2ax, right? Plus a squared. This is x minus a or that squared. So, I think that's the formula. All right. And then uh, we'll have, uh, for this one, we can multiply these two. I'll have minus cure of x minus cure 1. All of that divided by 6. 2 times 3 here is 6. Okay, and I'll have the exact same expression inside here. So, I'll have again x squared minus 2ax plus... A squared okay for this one so uh, I can bring the terms in x squared minus 2 a x plus a squared together right so this will give me our a x uh, should I use minus or plus this one is minus this one is minus so if I use minus I will have minus into x squared minus 2 a x plus a squared all of that into uh all of that into cure one on two okay this minus i'll put it into consideration plus cure of x on six minus cure one minus cure one on six which is the expansion of this one all right wow that becomes simple i hope that you guys are following and i hope that uh, there is no mistake so um, I will have our ax minus. Oh wow! So we can simplify, right? S squared minus two ax. If somebody just enters now. You say, man, what's 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 happening here? What's happening? Why are we having a's and f's and our a's and what what's the bugaboo? What's wrong? Gets kidnapped from my ship. Okay, so uh, that's what we get. And continue. And here we will simplify. So should I expand this now or later? Let me leave it first. I will have cure of x on six, and then here these two. I will have half minus half. Minus one seed. Certainly that will give me one third, right? Because this one goes this way, but let's just go ahead. So I will have three here. Three times three, which will give me three minus one, uh, two divided by six. And then I will have one third, correct? So uh, plus cure one on 
plus cure one on three. Okay, perfect. Uh, mm, at this juncture, I want to replace cure of x by m x plus n. But I'm seeing, I'm trying to see the right place to do that. I'm trying to see the right place to do that. Is there a way for Ross to multiply polynomials in MATLAB directly? Anyway, let's just go. Let's just go. Um, I'll replace. I'll replace and then, okay, whatever it gives, it gives. So we'll have our A x minus s squared minus 2ax plus a squared into m x plus n let me say here on 6 let me say here on 6 plus q1 on 3 now look at this these ones are constants okay this n on 6 plus q1 on 3 there is a constant okay we have M, N, O, P, R. I'm trying to. Okay, let me call the, that constant R. Okay, so we'll say let, let small r be equal to N on 6 plus Q1 on 3. Okay, so in that way we can simplify again and say R A X minus X squared minus 2 A X plus a squared okay all of that times um, times what mx on six right uh, plus plus r let's have it this way okay because I need us to write everything in terms of a polynomial everything we just want polynomial x cube x squared x okay so it's because I'm seeing the way I will do things later on. Good. So uh, here, um, so the, the focus here would be, let's just, we we'll have to multiply this times this, and then this times that, then this times this, and then this times that, then this times this, and then this times that, right? So open the, the bracket. So we we'll have our AX, don't forget the minus outside here, minus M X Q on six. Uh, what was that again? What was the next thing? Minus R X squared. Okay, and then plus these two here will cancel here. Okay, so we we'll have A M X squared. Okay, A M X squared. That's very correct. Okay, A M x squared divided by 3 okay please let me know if i'm making a mistake here because i myself i'm already right into the mathematics so plus that, 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 that and then here plus again um, 2 a x a r x let me put the constants before the x 2 a r x okay and then finally we'll have minus Mm, m a squared x on 6 and then minus a squared uh, a squared r so i think that's what we'll get that's what we'll get so now for the m2 of x is now a matter of bringing x cubed first then x squared together then x together then the constant together okay <laughs> Brenda, what do you mean like at this point you don't think we can see the mistake just follow up with the are you telling me that you are lost or how because i don't i don't get it so uh we'll have m2 of x finally to be equal to we want x cube this is it here Minus m x cube on six. Minus m x cube on six, and then uh, we have uh, what was that? X squared. The terms in x squared will have what? 
we'll have this one. Let me take the positive one first. AM on 3, right? Okay, we have AM on 3 here. Plus AM on 3. And then we have uh, minus R. Minus R. And then we have... Uh, <laughs> these guys don't make me to laugh. Minus R and here, all of that will be the terms in X squared. Okay? Now the terms in X will have R A, right? So we'll have plus R A. Imagine that we were pulling just... Guys, just imagine that uh, we were pulling all of those formulae. That is, we were writing R A completely. We were writing R B completely. We were writing Q of X completely. It would have been another stress, really. Okay, so we have uh, plus R A. The next term, it's okay. I've, I've taken R A Rita. Okay, it's there. R A and then uh, the next term here is plus two A R. That's the next term in X. I'm not forgotten anything, right? Yes, plus 2AR. So I'll have plus 2AR. The next term in X is this one. Okay, minus, okay, there's minus here, minus MA squared on 6. Minus MA squared on 6. And all of that will be times X. Okay, that's our term in X, right? And then we have our constant. I think this is the only constant here, the only term without x. So minus a squared r. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So this is our formula. Zone so two moment equation. Okay. Ah, super califragilistic expialidocious guys, right? All right, so to calculate t two of x, t two of x, all we need to do is to differentiate uh, m two of x. Okay, with respect to x, that's what we will do. We we'll just differentiate m two of x with respect to x, and we will get our our t two of x. Okay, so it means at the end of the day, what are we going to get here? I'm going to get. Um, Negative, what's that? A differential negative m x squared divided by two, right? Yes, okay, and then plus uh, this one will be two into a m on three minus r all of that times x. And then the differential of this will simply be that, okay, plus RA plus 2AR minus MA squared on 6. And this will be T2 of X. So somebody is asking a question. Let's do a check after getting T2 of X because this math is no longer so sweet. <laughs> uh, I, guess, uh, I know. So why using X minus A instead of B for the for that portion? Because we are getting, I know, we, we are getting in between. Where is it? We don't have the overall distance B, okay? We don't have the overall distance B. We have cut. We have done a cutting here to determine the internal forces. It's a cutting that we have done. So it is not B that we are using. We know the distance A that is the distance from here to here. We know that from where we have cut right to the origin, we know the distance there is X, right? It's not B. So the final distance here will be X minus A. We cannot use B there. So I hope that that answers our last question. Uh, yes, Rita. This one, I think that we'll have to go by faith, okay? And then we'll let my lab tell us whether, when well, we'll be in my lab, we'll let my lab tell us whether our T2 of X is correct or how, okay? Because, want to start going to check it now, then 
we might waste a lot of time there just checking that okay so we'll get back to that later on okay so uh that was zone two <laughs> so zone three now we're finished with zone two zone three I don't even okay so this is zone three okay zone three goes from here okay from here from the end of the load right up to the end of the beam okay and this is where we are getting so it goes from a plus b to l okay so zone three goes from a plus b right up to right up to l all right good uh what do we get? What do we get? So let's continue. Okay, so when we cut there, obviously, if I cut here, I cannot bear the risk to come and see this this load again with all of its uh, congruence. Now, what even exists? I will cut and then look the other way, right? So, what we want to do? We have this. Okay, so. We'll cut and then look the other way. So I will have m3 of x, and here I will have c3 of x, and here I will have our o3. Okay, so uh, the distance here, <laughs> ay, ay, ay. guys, just try to just try to get the. The sense okay just try to get the the logic those formulae they are formulae that i'll be putting back and you will be seeing and all that i will implement them on in mad lab so no no shaking no fear okay okay so uh these are t3 of x these are m3 of x right and then uh, what do we want what do we want guys Okay, the distance here is L minus X. Okay, that's the distance. Because we're getting and looking, looking the other way, right? So we have here L minus X, and we have our reaction here, RB. As simple as that. So here, some of us is following Y equal to zero. We cause our T3 of X to be equal to negative, negative RB. And then some of moments about O3 will cause our M3 of X to be equal to um, RB, right, into L minus, into L minus X. That's it. Full stop. Okay. We know the value of RB, right? We have a, a long expression for RB behind. All right. So, uh, that's that. So now we have the equations for uh, the point load. We have the equations for trapezoidally distributed. Have I even been naming those pages again? This is 6, 5. Where is 7 and 8? This is 9. How do we reach 9 without going through 7 and 8? Without going through 7 and 8. I'm writing so much here that I'm getting lost in my own papers. Uh -huh, this is it somewhere down. Okay, so uh, this is 7 and 8 good. Alright. This is 7 and 8. So we are here on 9 and 10. Okay. So this is 10. Good. So, uh, that's it. Okay, we have gotten our internal forces. We have we have gotten everything. So now we can we can go to MATLAB. All right, we can go to MATLAB and uh, do something. So in MATLAB now, I would like us to create okay uh, two functions. All right. So let's go to MATLAB. We are right there. This is everybody knows. Everybody here knows MATLAB. So we are right here. In MATLAB, we will need to create we will need to create two functions. Okay. The first function, we want the first function to give us the equation of the moment for the point load 
for the first for the first zone and the second zone and we want the second function to give us the equation of the moment for the three other zones for the trapezoidal distributed load okay so once we create two functions one for the point load the other one for the trapezoidal distributed load okay so or should we just create the same function and then they will have a type attribute okay a type attribute that tells us whether the type is a uniformly distributed load or a point no it's okay let's create two functions okay good so before we go there there's something i want to show you guys in matlab okay uh in matlab th there is a reason why i wanted to express all of those functions in terms of polynomials because when you have polynomials in matlab you can you can uh, easily work okay so let me let me give an illustration MATLAB uh, has specific functions that see vectors as polynomials. All right. So, for example, in MATLAB, let me let me come back to the paper first. So, for example, in MATLAB, if I want to express, let me go to my rough work. Rough work. In MATLAB, if I want to express a polynomial. Uh, 2x squared plus plus 3x plus 1 for example okay if i want to express this polynomial in matlab right what i will do is that i'll create a vector that will say 2 3 1 full stop and matlab will see this okay when i'll be using some polynomial functions some built-in polynomial functions matlab will recognize this as this polynomial all right, so it means if I go to MATLAB and I create P is equals to uh, 2, 3, 1. I have done just that, created a polynomial. Okay, so let's begin to do some things with this polynomial so that you understand exactly what I am, I am talking about. Okay, so 2x squared plus, wow, that was well chosen, by the way. That was very well chosen. So 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, for example. If I want to solve this polynomial to find its roots, okay, to find the values of x that will make this polynomial to be equal to 0, what would I do? I will 2x squared plus 3x plus 1 equals 0, right? I need to look for two numbers that when they add, they will give me 3x, and when they multiply, they give me 2x squared, right? So they give me the, the, the multiplication of these two. So those numbers... Will simply be plus 2x plus plus x plus 1 right all of that have to be equal to 0 right so what is common in these two i have 2x which is common give me x plus 1 and here i have 1 which is common to give me x plus 1 equals equals 0 right and here x plus 1 is common for both of them so i have x plus 1 and i have 2x plus 1 to give me 0 by implication x will be equal to negative 1 or x will be equal to negative half, right? Because if a times b is equal to 0, it is either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0. So x equals to negative half and x equals to uh, negative 1 are the roots of that particular of that particular polynomial, right? So in that lab, if I want to do that, I don't need to stress, okay? MATLAB recognizes P as a polynomial. So this is 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. If I want to find the root of this polynomial, I will just say roots, roots of P. Okay? So the moment I say roots of P and I press enter, MATLAB, behave yourself. Behave yourself. Oh my God. Give me my answer. Good. So it gives me negative 1 and then negative 0 0.5 exactly what what we got okay so you see that this roots function will see a vector that you put inside here as a polynomial not as a matlab vector per se but as a polynomial all right so it's a way of telling you that if you want to create a polynomial in matlab and use some functions on the polynomial okay you just need to organize the polynomial in uh, in uh, ascending order of degrees or descending order of degrees of x okay so say for example i want to represent the polynomial p to i want i want it to be x squared plus one 
all the degrees must be represented. The highest degree here is what is two. Then you have to represent the number for the next degree. You have to represent the number for the next degree. Uh, then when I say the next degree is the degree minus one, right? Then the next degree, that degree minus one, and so on and so forth. So to represent x squared minus two, for example, I will say p two. Okay, is equal to what's the what's the, the the I'll open my my brackets first. What's the coefficient of x squared one? Okay, and what's the coefficient of x first? Zero. And there was a coefficient of the constant 1. This is my x squared minus 1. As opposed to x plus 1, which will be 1, 1. Okay? So you need to represent the coefficient of each of the degrees of x. And that will form uh, your polynomial as a vector in MATLAB. With this polynomial, you can do a lot. You can do a lot of things, guys. Okay? So let me show you what I'm talking about, for example. We're well, this in the roots. Of something that can calculate the roots of a particular equation. So, what does this mean? It means that if I express my moment the way we were seeing it, okay, if I express my moment as this particular polynomial, right, and I want to calculate uh, the maximum of this moment, what do I need to do? I'll need to differentiate this, but then the t of x that I have here will be the differential of this, right? So, this t of x now. What does it become? This is what I need to find the roots of this t of x. It will give me the value of x for which m max will be equal to, to 0. Because it is equating this to 0 and solving for this. That gives me x where m will be marked. Right? So, when I find the roots of this one, because this is a polynomial, this is x squared, that's x, and this is the constant. Okay? It's a polynomial. So, when I find the roots of this, it will give me the x that I need. I will now get that x and come and replace it here in m and it will give me my m max. Because what is important here again, guys, for the design is m max and t max. Don't forget where we are going. Alright? Good. The other thing I want to show you with polynomials before we dive into the function is uh, how to differentiate them. It means that once we are having m2 of x, for example, we can already differentiate it. Okay? So, uh, Let's differentiate this 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, for example. If we differentiate it manually, what are we going to get? We are going to get 4x, right, plus 3. That will be our answer now. 4x plus 3. And the corresponding MATLAB representation of this 4x plus 3 as a polynomial will be something like 4, 3, right? It'll be something like 4, 3. So, let's look at that in MATLAB, okay? So, remember our polynomial P was that, 2, 3, 1, right? So, to differentiate this, I will just say poly, I hope I remember that, poly there, okay, of P. And, uh, wow, computer should really be, it's extremely slow in, in processing information. So that's it, right? You have 4 and 3, which is what? The differential of, of P. So to differentiate any polynomial, I will do poly there. So, why am I saying this? Because my moment is expressed as a polynomial. And uh, to differentiate that moment, I'll just say poly there of the moment. Okay? And then that poly there now of the moment, I look for the roots. I get those roots. I make sure that they are between the range that I want. And then I replace it back into the original polynomial to get the value of m max. And how do you get the value of a particular polynomial at a given point x? Okay? There's another function for that. So MATLAB has us covered, right? It has us covered. We are we are safe. <laughs> we have no problem. So remember, we are written the p of x, 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. If I want to get the value of uh, the polynomial at x, for example, equal to 0, or at any given x, right? Let's say at x equals to 2. Then I will have my p of 2, right? To be equals to 2 into 2 squared plus... 3 into 2 plus 1. And uh, at the end of the day, 2 squared gives me 4. Okay, 4 times 2, 8. And then 8 plus 6, 14, plus 1, 15. Okay, so in MATLAB, to get this value, remember that our polynomial was P, I'll use the function poly, polyval. Okay, and then in polyval, the first thing I'll indicate is is the polynomial itself, comma, the value of x at which I want to evaluate the polynomial. In this case, we chose 2, right? 
and when I press enter, that should normally give me 15, okay? And that's 15. So, after I've gotten the roots, I can just use polyval with my uh, moment equation and then pop, I get the maximum, okay? Of the moment at that particular point X. <clears throat> so, I hope you have a little glimpse of where we are of where we are going is it is this flowing i said please if you have any questions okay any difficulty you just just indicate you just just let me know okay good so let's go ahead now and create our function okay let's go ahead and create our function so i will say edit right Mm. Good. So here we want to create a function. To create a function in MATLAB, obviously you start with the keyword function, right? And uh, this function is technical. It's really technical. It's supposed to give us two values, okay? And uh, when you want your function to have two outputs, you put the two outputs in this, okay? In the square brackets. The first output we want is the moment distribution. We'll call it m of x. Okay. The second output we want is the share distribution. We'll call it t of x. And then we'll call this uh, point. Let me say internal internal point. Ah, yeah. I don't have inspiration for names today. Eh? So when I say internal point. <laughs> What I mean by internal point is internal forces for the point load. Okay, so please just take it like that. Now, internal forces for the point load. What are the values that? Let me come back to what we were doing. What are the values that we get? We will need. Okay. Mm, maybe I should try to copy that this way. Let me let me look for something so that I don't have to value of x at once and how please yes Rita you can input more than one value of x at once and you can do that by putting x as uh, as a vector okay so uh, let me try that again polyval okay if I put x here 2 and then comma for example 0 I think that should give me 15 and 1 are you seeing that so 15 is for x equals to 2 and 1 is for x equals to 0 okay so I hope that that answers your question uh good let me get this ground frame here mm, copy yeah okay good so uh i hope that you're seeing that so for this guy let me try to move him a little bit that way yeah, yeah i just want to show you guys uh, where we were Wait, uh, we will need a value of of a, right? So let's start with the with the value of the point load itself. We need p, okay? Then we need let's say the length of the beam. We'll say l, right? This is it right here, the length of the beam, okay? And then uh, what do we need again? We need uh, no, come on. We need the length of the beam, okay? We need P. We need what? We need the value of A. And that's it now. If we have the value of A, we can get B very easily. Okay? So we just need A. And uh, life will be good. We can deduce uh, B from there. Okay? So that's what we get. Alright? Good. Uh, so we can now write whatsoever we want to write here as a value of mx and uh, mt so what are we starting by hmm. Hmm. so you see that the value here the value of the moment here will, will depend on whether we are in uh wait, wait guys wait a minute what are we doing even here what are we doing here Okay, we want internal. Let's not get lost. 
we want internal forces equations for mx and tx okay so we want them as polynomials remember as polynomials for the first zone and the second zone okay we don't need to stress we already have our formula we don't need to stress so here what i will say but if i say we don't need to stress again like that are we going to survive yeah i guess we are okay so i will say mx is equal to now what i'll use here to put the the, the two values is uh, i'll use a cell okay i'll use a cell so that it can contain the two equations okay a cell is another way of uh, doing matrices but within cells you can you can put more than numbers you can also put matrices as different entries of the cell so in a cell for example i can put a matrix a here comma a matrix b in the same cell and i can reference the matrix a later on and the matrix b later b later on in the same cell this is important because for mx okay we have two equations we want to put the first equation comma the second equation so we know that the first equation will be the equation for the first zone second equation will be the equation for for the second zone okay so uh, just take it like that for now oh uh, let me bring back the paper good so what is our value here so this is what we have here okay so m1 of x we said it is p b on l times x are we together so we need to express this as a polynomial okay so for that it will be my first value here i will just open my bracket so this is where i will express my first uh this thing my first uh, here i will express my first zone moment equation and here i will express my second zone moment equation all right so my first zone moment here will be uh p now we have p times b now b here is what b is l minus a okay so it will be times l minus a okay because here we have let me try to reduce this again all right so here we have uh, as you can see here here we have a we don't have b okay we don't have b we have a so it will be p times l minus a okay then comma mm, zero okay because we have a term in x but we have no constant okay we have a term in x but we have no constant so for the other one i think it's the same thing we have a term in x here oh here we have a term in x and a constant for zone two right so the term in x will be what negative p a on l right the term in x if we open this bracket it will be negative p a on l so we we'll represent it here negative p times a all of that divided by divided by l did i divide here by l this way it's divided by l right so we should be very careful i have to divide here by l divided by divided by l okay uh p times negative p times a on l is a coefficient for x and then now the constant comma the constant here will be p times a right as simple as that because the l here will cancel this l all right so we'll just have p a so the constant will be p times a so again these vectors are to be viewed as these are polynomials okay they are to be viewed as polynomials that will represent the are uh, equations so for a beam that will have a point load p right for a beam of length l that will have a point load of magnitude p at uh, a point of application of a distance of a from the uh, original position okay the distribution the maximum moment uh what, what was i saying say maximum moment the moment distribution will be this one for the first zone and it will be this one for the second zone so it will be p times l minus a on l times x for the first zone and it will be p 
a negative p times a on lx plus p times a for the second zone. Okay, so that's it for m of x. Alright? So for t of x now, for t of x now, let me put semicolon there. Okay? And for t of x, for t of x, For t of x, I will have, uh, what, what will I have? It's a derivative now, so this one here will just disappear. I'll just have that one. In fact, it will be a constant, no need to, it will just be a constant. And here too, it will be a constant, right? Just the derivative. That's what we have, even according to a formula that, that you can see there. Okay? So, let me, let me try to, <laughs> let me try to use this so that, so that you guys can see what we are talking about practically, all right? So I'm sorry if the, the frustration is already there, okay? Don't worry, you 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 will be able to, to catch up. All right, so uh, I'll save this. So remember, these are function internal internal point, okay? Now I want to go and use it. So let me let me make this big again so that we take a practical example. Okay, so listen guys. Where is my pen? Okay. So make it this one. So look at this. Let's say we have a case where the user has come and uh, he has put, uh, what was that? He has said he wants to model this particular beam. The value here is 3 meters and here is 3 meters and here, for example, is 6 meters and then uh, the value of the load, let's say, is 20 kilonewton. All right, so he wants to calculate this, and he wants to get uh, he wants to get the equation for the for the bending moment for this one, and then maybe from the equation he wants to calculate uh, the maximum bending moment and uh, the maximum shear force. Right. So, what are we going to do? The real answer for this case, first of all, the real answers for this case. We can just follow the formula now. This is our formula here. Right? So, for this case, our T1, our T1 of X will be equal to, it is P, which is 20, times B, which is 3, divided by, by L, which is what, which is 6. So, our T1 of X will be equal to 10, 10 kilonewton. It will be a constant. That will be our T1 of X. Okay, and then our m1 of x, our m1 of x according to our formula here, okay, will be the same thing, 20 times 3 on 6, okay, but times, times x, okay, so our m1 of x will be equals to 10x, right, kilonewton meters normally. That will be our m1 of x. Alright? And then our t2 of x from our formula down, our t2 of x will simply be the opposite. It will be 2. If you calculate it, you will get negative 10, 10 kilonewton as t2 of x. And then our m2 of x, our m2 of x, if you calculate it, uh, you will have, uh, what's that? Uh, Negative 10 outside already, okay? Now times 6 minus, uh, what's that? X. Okay, because L here is 6 and then X, okay? This will not be negative 10, okay? This will be 10, as simple as that, just 10. So the final M2 of X, if you write it in terms, if you write it as a polynomial with X first, 
we we'll have negative 10x right plus plus 60. This will be our m2 of x. All right. So normally for point load, these are the values that we will be looking for. So this that is the way you use uh, this this particular MATLAB function. So let me try to reduce this. You can still see the values, right? I hope you can still see the values there. Uh, and then let's go and use this function now on on our command window. Okay, so to use it, what would I say? Internal. I'll call the two values. Let me call it this time m comma t. Okay, m comma t will be equal to internal point. Okay, so MATLAB should propose us the, the values according to what we have created. Oh, 2018 is really, really slow on my computer. Come on. Internal point. Have I, have I spelled good? Thank you. So, what to indicate the value of P? Okay. Our value of P here is what? Our value of P is, is 20. All right. So, we have 20, comma. We have to indicate the value of L. Our value of L here is 6. 6 comma indicate the value of a a value of a here is 3 right okay and once we get that perfect so we have m that is a 1 by 2 array because it contains in the first place here the equation of the first zone and here the equation of the second zone t is the same the, it contains the equation of the first zone and the second zone but you can already see t here right you can already see that t1 here is 10 and then t2 here is negative 10 just like we have t1 here to be 10 and t2 here to be negative 10 what we want to see now is m also okay so to get m you will say m the indexing with uh, with cells is a little bit different to index cells you have to put the curly braces if you want to get the exact values that is found in a particular cell position i said to understand cell is the same it's the same principle as matrices okay is the same principle as matrices for cells but just that cell can contain different data types it can contain even arrays at respective positions okay but you index it exactly the same way if you index uh, a cell as a matrix you get a cell if you index a cell as what i'm indexing now you will get the corresponding value within the cell that's a long explanation on its own so to get the first zone's equation, I will say m of 1, right? And you see that it's what? It's 10, 0. What is the interpretation here? It is 10x, right? Because the constant here is 0. So this is 10x plus 0x to the power 0, right? So it is 10x. And what do we have here? Uh, we have here 10x for zone 1, all right? And then for zone 2, what do we get? Oh, sorry, Victor. Sorry about that. For zone 2, we have negative 10, 60. This is what we have, right? Interpretation here is negative 10x times 60. And that's what we're having here. Negative 10x and 60. All right? So, it's 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 very simple. And we can we can even plot. We can even plot the, the, the diagrams here for you just to see how... Uh, should I do that? Should I do that? Okay, let me just let me just write a script that will that will plot. Okay, that will plot for whatsoever value we are we are having. Hmm. Okay. So let's do that. So uh, to plot, I will need to run the function first. Okay. So this is our beam here, right? We will get the value of m and that way in the script here okay so this is our beam it is loaded 20 kilo newton it has a length of six and the point load is at a distance of three meters to uh, the origin of the beam all right so now I want to to plot this thing the very first thing I'll do is I'll plot the beam first okay I'll plot the beam first so I'll say line to plot with line I have to indicate uh, I have to indicate let me sort of hold on okay let me hold on here so that 
when I'm doing new plots, it does not erase the previous plots that were present. So to plot a line, I'll have to indicate all of the, the, the x values of the line. So this is what I have. I have a line, right? I have 0.1 and I have 0.2. 0.1 has an x and y coordinate, x1, y1. And 0.2 has x2, y2, right? I'll need to indicate the x coordinate of 0.1 and the x coordinate of 0.2 first. Then the y coordinate of 0.1 and the y coordinate of 0.2. So I want to point my to plot a line that starts at 0, 0. Okay, because it is my beam. My beam is like that. It starts at 0, 0 and then it ends at uh, L, 0, right? That's where it ends. So the x coordinates will be what? 0, L, right? X1, X2. So I'll just indicate it in the vector. I'll have 0, uh, 6, which is L in this case. Okay? And then the y coordinates are, I'll indicate them again in another vector, 0, 0. So let me just make the line width here, okay? The property line width. I hope it has that. The line width property here. Let me take it so, so that we can see something a little bit thick. Let me try to say 5. If I run this, what does that give me? Let me say, I mean, I'll call it the same plot beam. What does it give me? What does it give me? What does it give me? Is there an error? Oh, my lad. Slow to execute my functions. Slow to execute my functions. They are slow to execute my functions. I think if I continue using this computer, <laughs> I'll certainly need to revert back to 2014. Eh? If it's taking so much time to execute every every single line of code I'm giving, then there's a problem. That executed, but now the code, the, the plotting, I still have to wait for the plot to come. Has it come? Oh, not yet. That's where the plot will certainly land at any given time t. Uh, that's it. It's really slow. It's really slow, guys. Okay, good. So that's that. Okay, so that's my line. It goes from zero right up to six. Okay, so I want to plot now the. I want to plot the equations, the 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 bending moment equation, and then the the shear equation for the for the point load. So. M here and T here give me the equations in question, okay? And they give me, give them to me in the form of polynomial. I know how to evaluate uh, the value of a polynomial at different points, okay? So, to plot that, aye, aye. I'll first of all plot the first zone of M. Let, let's plot uh, M of X first, okay? So, I'll say plot... <laughs> I'll need to indicate all of the x values, okay? For the x values, I will say uh, lean space. Let's say we want to plot for something like, like 10 values, okay? So, the first one, where did it go to? It, it was from 0 to A, right? You remember that? The first zone, this is it. The first zone was from 0 to A. You remember that? Sorry, from 0 to A. That was the first zone. So, I'll need to say you plot... From 0 right up to A here, which is 3. Okay, from 0 to 3. Let's take, you give us 10 points there. That's our X. Okay, now what will our Y be? Our Y is the equation of the moment in question first. So we are in the first zone. So we are talking about M of 1. But this one is supposed to be a function. Okay, and it's supposed to be a polynomial. And we have seen how to calculate the value of X at uh, different points or the value of a polynomial for different values of x, right? So we will say polyval of 
we'll say polyval of and what are the values of x for which we want to calculate this it is these same values of x right of that so normally if i execute this huh, did i let me let me copy something again did i copy something wrong somewhere it seems that like there's an additional bracket that is not supposed to be there let me copy this again and see okay perfect so uh uh that so normally this plot is supposed to give me the first half okay of the moment so let's try to run that okay are you seeing that it's supposed to give me the first half so I, i'll just put in negative so that uh so that we it, it comes out the way we are used to seeing it all right let me put in negative so that it comes out the way we are used to seeing it good so this is the first half of the bending moment okay so now the second half i will take this very one but now i want it for zone two right i want it for zone two zone two goes from a which is 3 right up to l6 okay from a which is 3 right up to l which is 6 and then uh, here will be zone 2 okay as simple as that so this one represents the equation for zone 1 this uh, for zone 2 sorry this one represents the equation for zone 1 okay they are expressed in terms of polynomial so i can use polyval to get the value of x of different uh, the value of the moment for different values of for different values of x as simple as that if i run this now okay that's that chuck chuck okay so this is my bending moment uh diagram and i think that's correct okay so for the share for the share it will be exactly the same thing but just that we need to put one we need to put tt okay so for the share will be the same thing but this will be t and this one will be will be t uh yes it starts here and then starts here and goes here the problem here is that there is a point that we are supposed to uh there's normally a line that's supposed to connect this point and uh, this other point down here okay from our bending from the way we draw let me, let me represent it here It's supposed to be something like this right so that's why you see the value here where is that you see that this one up here represents okay one of the lines and then this one down represents the other line okay so there's supposed to be a connection here from the way we draw right but that's not our dilemma i just want you guys to understand where we are going when we create uh, a function like this one all right, we'll create a function like this one. That's exactly where we are going. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm not seeing your I'm not seeing your faces right now. But uh, tell me, uh, so far so good, right? At least you're understanding something. You're not completely understanding everything, but you're you're understanding something, right? I'm sure. Okay, so uh, the next thing we want to do is just to complete, to create the other function, right? To create the other function, this one was just for point load. We want to complete and create the other function for trapezoidal load. And once we are finished creating these functions, we can then go back to uh, we can go back to uh, our MATLAB now and then create the interface. Okay, we can create the interface and. Uh, see where our beam will be see where we'll ask the user to enter a to enter p to enter l and see how he will add it and all the like so we can do all of that but let's finish that function first so to create a function i'll copy this one okay i'll copy this one and then i'll create uh, a new function let's call this one internal trapper uh, trappers yeah let me just say trappers yeah. that's a little inspiration i can get now for the trapezoidal load okay which is from here okay for trapezoidal load which is from here 
what are the unknowns that we have? The unknowns that we have, we have cure one. Right? When it comes to the load, we have cure one, comma, cure two. Okay? Then, what are the, un the other unknowns? We have L. Okay? L also, we have L problem. And then we have A, uh, comma, B, comma, C. Okay? I think with that, we are not forgetting anything. Okay? From our modeling, that's what we get. Okay? So, the difference with the trapezoidal here is that we need to calculate, first of all, the value of RA. Because remember how complex it was, right? Or we calculate, first of all, RB. Then we calculate RA. Then all right. So, let's go ahead and do just that. So, we had RB to be equal to... What is that equation? Good. So, this was our RB here in terms of all that we are entering there, right? So, uh, it was Q1 times B. Mm, let me write that. Q1 times B. So, let me just open the bracket times. Sorry. Times. Uh, what's in the bracket? 3 times A. 3 times A plus uh, B. All of that divided by 6 times L. So we need to put it in bracket. 6 times L. Is it true that 6 times L actually divides everything? It's true now. 6 times L actually divides everything, right? So we can put it in a final bracket when we have added the 2. Okay? So let me just put a bracket here. And put a bracket here and then I'll add the other one inside here okay because it divides the two all right so uh cure one da, 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 da. where are we good and um, so what to add the the the, the cure to part two I'll copy this one they say programmers are lazy by nature they don't mean that they're really lazy they mean that they don't like to retype the same things twice or they don't like redundancy. So plus Q2 times B and then times 3A plus 2 times B, right? Plus 2 times B. And uh, yes, that would be that. Okay? That would be that. So it is all of that now divided by, by 6 times L. Because the division of 6 times L here is in common for both of them. So that would be our RB. All right? So, what about RA? RA will be equal to, we have a formula here for RA uh, in terms of RB, right? So, RA will be, I don't even know why we calculated that RA again. We just wasted time there for nothing. Will be cure 2, uh, cure 2 plus cure 1, okay? Uh, all of that times B divided by 2. All right, and minus RB, as simple as that. So that would be our RA, okay? And um, what about, what's the next step here? We have RA, we have RB, and then with RA and RB, we have to go now into the internal forces, right? So we could now determine uh, the moment of zone 1, I think so. So this is where we were, right? Zone 1. So for zone 1, we got that M1 of X was RA times X. So you see that we are here, okay? Zone 1, M1 of X was RA times X. One was just the coefficient. So we will have here RA, all right? Okay, and then uh, here we have 0. Hmm. Yeah, we have 0, RA. Zero perfect. Uh, here that would be for zone one, okay. And then for T for zone one, we have just RA, so zone one for T will be just just RA, okay. What about zone two? That's the next zone two. We had a very, very long equation, I can remember that. What is our zone two? Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is zone 2. Okay. 
This is our zone 2 equation here. So for zone 2, um, <laughs> we have m, first of all, that we need to look for. Okay, so we had the value for m, right? We said m was equal to m was equal to, we need to look for that now. Mm. Okay, so this is it here. This is our value of m. m was equal to q2 q2 minus q1, right? And uh, n is equal to, hey, was it divided by something? q2 minus q1 all on b. Divided by B, okay, and then uh, what about N? N was equal to, let's just take it also, Q1, hmm. Q1 minus, um, minus Q2 minus Q1, okay, Q2 minus Q1, all of that times A, times A, and uh, divided by, divided by B. So that's what we got, right? For N also. Okay, so um, let's go back to our equation. So we have this, we have the value of M, it is known. M also here, it is known. Uh, we have array here also that we call something. These equations are just too many. Where is that place where we are? Okay, we say let array be equals to n, right? n on 6 plus q1 on 3. So we'll just create the array here to be equal to uh, n, n on 6, okay, plus q1 on 3, right? MATLAB obeys the board mass principle, so you do division before the addition. We have no problem. N on 6 plus Q1 on 3. Perfect. So, I think that with that, we can go ahead and we can go ahead and enter our, our function, right? So, we are here. We have M. We have M. We have R. We have RA. We have R. We have M. Perfect. So, we can go and enter this equation. So, this is for zone 2. Okay, for zone 2, we are here. This is where we are in zone 2, inside these other curly braces or square brackets. This is where we are. Okay, so we have to enter the expression in x cube first. And the expression in x cube here is what? Negative m divided by 6, right? So we have negative m on 6. Uh, is that so? Yes, and then for x squared, we have a times m on 3 minus r. We write just what we see here. a times m divided by 3 and then minus r. That's the term in x squared. The term in x now will be r a. So you see that we already have all of these values up here. So in the calculation, we do not need to pull all of those long expressions if we just express the new values in terms of the known values, then we can do just this in MATLAB and, uh, and we are good to go. So, um, plus 2AR plus 2 times A times R, okay, minus M times A squared. Where is the squared? Where is the squared? Hmm? Hmm. Okay, m times a squared. All of that divided by divided by six. Okay. Good. So that's the term in x, right? And then there's one last term as a constant. Negative a squared a squared times times r. And that does just that. Okay? 
good. So that is for m of x for zone 2. We now need for t of x for zone 2, right? So t of x for zone 2 will come here and add a comma and we'll have our curly braces. This is the equation here. Okay. So what will it be? Negative m on 2. Negative m on 2. And then comma, we have uh, 2. Or should I just put everything in the bracket, then multiply by 2 at the end? I think I'll do just that. Um, that will be A times M. A times. A times M. Uh, divided by 3. Divided by 3 minus R. All of that times 2. All of that times two, and that will be the term. That will be the term in x. We now need a term in the constant, right? So the constant will be R A. R A plus two times A times R minus uh, M times A squared times A squared divided. Am I confusing? No. Times a squared divided by by six. Yeah, so that will do. If I've done a mistake, you let me know. All right. If I've done a mistake, you let me know. Okay. So um, the last zone left here is zone three. Okay, for both of them. Okay. So. Zone 3 here, ah, that one is finished, right? This is zone 3 here, M3. For the moment, I can open my curly braces again and then indicate what the coefficient in X first, right? And it will be negative RB, as we can see here, comma, the constant, which is uh, RB times L. RB times L, and then for the reaction, it's still a constant, right? Yes, negative RB. And it's finished, guys. It's finished. So it means that in all of this, we do not even use C, right? That's funny. Yeah, we do not use C. Actually, if we have A and B, we can deduce C, right? Because C is the same as L minus A minus B. So when you see this like that, that might not be the case to you. It means that C was not used, right? So, no hoity-toity. All we need to do here is to delete the C because we don't have use for it. Mama lab is not responding. So, let's wait for the boss to come back to life. Okay. And that's that. That's that. Let me save that. So now we can implement this, okay? Let's try to implement this with our uniformly distributed, uh, uniformly distributed example, okay? So uniformly distributed example, let me just represent one here. Okay, so uh, we want this value to be 10 kN per meters, and then here and here, we'll have the distance here to be uh, something, let's say, 5, why not? Okay, let's use that. So, normally for this case, it will even give us one zone. You, you see that... Um, we don't necessarily need all of the zones, okay? You need to know how to play around this, uh, depending on what the user gives you, okay? So here, for example, the only zone that would matter in this case here will be the, uh, will be the middle zone, the zone of B, right? Because A here is not indicated, it's equal to zero, and C here is not indicated, it's equal to zero. So let's just try to implement that and uh, see what happens, okay? So we'll have Q1, to be 10 
in this case, right? And q out to to also be 10 in this case. So let's just say negative 10 and negative 10 because they are facing downwards, okay? And then L, we said is 5. The value of A, 0. The value of B is the same as L, which is 5. What does that give us? Hmm. Definition not supported in this context. Oh, sorry, sorry. We copied everything plus, plus function. We copied everything plus function. Right? A. What's that? P. Undefined function or variable P. Where do we use P again? Line 8. Is P still existing in that code? Where is P coming from? Oh, I do not delete this guy. I do not delete this other guy, right? We have just one, two, three equations, okay? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Let's try that again. Good. Perfect. So, uh, wow. Uh, I know. Don't worry. There's no need for for break. Okay, I am. I am. I am already finishing for today. All right, I'm already finishing for today. So for the rest, for the rest of the session, uh, after this we'll, we'll, we'll meet. I'll tell you guys. I'll tell you guys what to do. All right. So um, mx. In fact, you can already see here, when I say Tx, Tx here, negative 25 and here 25. What will be the reactions here? The reactions here will be 10 times 5, right? 10 times 5 will give us 50, and then 50 divided by 2 will give us the 1 here and the 1 here, right? So you already see that 25, 25. From the shape, I already see that the reactions will be correct, all right? But now, I want also to check for the bending moment, because normally we'll have just one zone here. In this case, we'll have just one zone, not two zones. So let's look at... The bending moment equation for the first zone in our case it should give us a uh, negative 25 and 0 y y negative 25 and 0 and here the second this second should give us 0 yes then 5 then negative this normally should be our only bending moment equation and then the third will give us 25 negative 125 well uh we'll investigate all of that okay we'll investigate all of that but what we need to make sure in these cases is that it takes only the zone that that we are interested in and leaves out leaves out the other zone because in this case we have just one zone and it is the middle zone okay we have just one zone and it is the middle zone so we'll continue from there in the in the second part which will be tomorrow morning all right We'll continue from there in the second part, which will be tomorrow morning. Uh, your exercise, your exercise before tomorrow morning, or your exercise, will be to reproduce exactly all that we've done today by using a cantilever beam. So, while I'll be doing it with the simply supported beam, your assignment will be to do it with the cantilever beam so that you follow along and you're sure that you're understanding and you're sure that you're you're flowing with what we are we are doing all right so um uh i'll tell you guys i'll tell you guys what to do next okay just just stick around just stick around okay so see you see you see you soon